Hello, thanks for joining us. Uh, today we're talking about managing multi-tenant clusters with GitOps. Uh, if this is your first time, this is part of what we call the Weave Online User Group. My name is Tomo Nakahara. I'm head of the developer experience team at a company called Weaveworks. And we are very fortunate today to have Stefan Prada on our team who will be talking about this topic. So hopefully you're here for this reason. So just a little bit about us. So I mentioned uh, we work for a company called Weaveworks. Uh, we're a startup based in London, New York, San Francisco, Berlin, and distributed teams. If you've heard of the technology RabbitMQ, our CEO, CTO, and some of our engineers are the people who created RabbitMQ, uh, sold the business to VMware, and then uh, found other possibilities to solve problems, especially in the uh, container space, and then more and more, especially today, in the Kubernetes space. Um, we are VC backed by Excel Partners and a couple other VCs, um, but one of them is Google Ventures. So I mentioned that because it kind of makes sense in terms of our um, deep involvement and contribution to the Kubernetes space. A little bit of our background is that um, we're very much founded on open source. Um, if you've known us for a while, um, WeaveNet has been our longest um, project. It's open source and is really one of the premier projects out there if you're looking to network your Kubernetes clusters. Um, we have many more than listed here, but some of the top ones are Cortex, Flux, Weave Scope, and Weave Flagger, uh, which you're very lucky. St Stefan is the one who created Weave Flagger. Um, and these are all a um, variety of um, projects out there that really help you with monitoring and doing automated deployments and doing getting observability um, of your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, Cortex is officially in the CNCF. Flux just got announced. Um, we'll actually have a special session in a couple weeks um, about our process of going into the CNCF as a sandbox project. Um, and we've got a couple others too, so we'll probably be covering those in the next week. Uh, we also, of course, are a company, uh, and these are our products. Uh, the longest product that we've had is called Weave Cloud, and it's a SaaS product uh, to manage your Kubernetes clusters. So some of the projects that I mentioned, Cortex, Scope, and Flux, those are actually um, part of this more combined SaaS uh, product. Uh, and more importantly, we run Weave Cloud on Kubernetes on AWS. So we have over four years of experience running Kubernetes in production. And part of some of the work that went into making that happen is now um, being productized in what, into what we call a Weave Kubernetes platform. So that will be coming out pretty soon. And if you've heard the term GitOps, um, we're the ones who coined that term. And so that's very much part of, as you'll see, so many of the topics that we cover as people are excited about GitOps. So the platform itself is a very GitOps aware platform um, for how you would want to execute your Kubernetes clusters. Um, because we have all those years of experience and because people often need a little bit of help along the way when they get started, we do offer some consulting training and support um, depending on what people need. So our website is weave.works. If you haven't heard of us, then please uh, check it out and feel free to contact us if you have questions. A little bit of housekeeping. So like I said, we have Stefan Prodan from our developer experience team here uh, speaking today. Uh, I'm Tomo, I'll be moderating uh, and taking in your questions. Uh, so usually um, this can be as short as 30 minutes, um, but it's usually between about 30 and 45 Stefan talks a lot, so I'm sure we'll be plenty, plenty full at the 45 minute mark. And if there are a lot of questions, a lot of discussion, then we will um, allow to go over, but we have a hard, hard stop at 60 minutes. So that is the longest that we ever have. We're using a platform called Zoom. And so when you ask questions, the best way will be to use the chat box. Hopefully you guys have found the button to find that. Um, if you don't see the button on your top left corner of your screen, uh, sometimes hitting escape will get you out of full screen mode and you can see the Zoom function out a little bit better. Uh, please reminder, reminder, when you send your chat questions and sometimes people even answer each other's questions, make sure that you're addressing your chat to everyone or to all panelists or attendees. Uh, otherwise those questions or comments only come to us and so people can't see it. Unless you have something burning and private that you want to just send to me, uh, please make sure to choose all panelists and attendees. So with that, I will hand it over to Stefan. Okay, share my screen. Perfect. Great. 
Hello folks, um, today we'll be talking about uh, multi-tenancy and how we can manage a multi-tenant cluster, a Kubernetes cluster of course, with um, tools like Flux and Customize. Um, for those that are not familiar with GitOps, um, here is a short introduction to GitOps. So GitOps is built on DevOps uh, and uh, considers Git as a single source of truth for, your, for the desired state of your system. Uh, what that means is you keep your YAMLs in a Git repo and you don't um, apply them directly on your cluster. So you don't interact with your cluster, you interact only with a Git repo. Um, some advantages of using GitOps is the fact that operational changes can be made by pull requests. So for example, your team can uh, approve and I know, analyze any change in your, production, in your production system before it goes live. Um, you get rollbacks and audit logs uh, via Git history. Um, the entire system state is, uh, is, is under version control and described in a Git repository. That, that's the most important part. Like everything uh, from um, your cluster definition, for example, you can use a cluster API implementation and you can keep those cluster definition in a Git repo uh, throughout um, workloads, um, controllers, custom resource definition, and all of that. Um, another part of GitOps is uh, detecting and alerting on configuration drift, and we'll see how Flux uh, makes that easy. Um, and of course, when something goes wrong, because you have everything in Git, you can easily restore it. Um, these are the highlights of, of GitOps. Um, in order to apply GitOps to Kubernetes, um, we are recommending some open source tools. Um, Flux is our GitOps operator. Um, its main function is to synchronize the definitions between Git and the cluster. And um, it also um, scans your container registries and can uh, deploy new container images in your cluster based on some uh, deployment policies that you can specify per, uh, uh, per deployment. Uh, another component that you could use is uh, the Flux Helm operator. Uh, so the Helm operator is a CRD controller, which makes uh, Helm declarative. So it can describe uh, Helm operations like install, upgrade, delete uh, for your charts with a custom resource and that custom resource can uh, be uh, stored in a Git repo. Um, Another component that you could use is Flagger. It's a progressive delivery operator. So Flagger um, can automate the promotion of canary deployments, blue-green, or even A-B testing. If you are using a service mesh, if you are not using a service mesh, then you can use it for uh, simple blue-green deployments. Um, and Flagger also helps you um, validate your new versions that you are trying to deploy in production by running integration tests, load tests, and all sorts of uh, checks. Um, and last but not least, Prometheus, uh, because GitOps, one of, one of the GitOps principles is um, having observability and alerting capabilities when, when the desired state changes or when the cluster state drifts from the desired state. Um, all these operators that you see here, Flux, Helm, Flagger, all expose um, Prometheus metrics. And if you have a Prometheus server inside your cluster that's configured to scrape these operators, then you can uh, create dashboards and have alerting when something goes wrong. This is how Flux looks like. So Flux is a, is a daemon, it runs inside your cluster. Um, it is deployed alongside Memcache. Um, and Flux uh, can be configured to connect to a Git repo. And 
Flux also scans all the, um, uh, the so first of all, it makes a list with all the containers that are running inside your cluster. Then it uses the pull secret to connect to the container registries. And from there, it pulls the images metadata. And that metadata is stored in memcache. Why we do that is because we can, we can tell Flux to automatically update um, containers. So instead of manually going into Git every time you um, you release a new version of your app, you can tell Flux to automatically uh, apply that version in your cluster. And um, we do that by storing uh, the metadata in memcache and uh, we, we scan for these um, deployment policies. And when we detect a new version that matches a policy, then we commit that change to Git and we apply the new, the new version on the cluster. Uh, Flux also has a feature called garbage collection. How that works, if let's say you've added a deployment in your Git repo and after some time you, you delete that deployment from Git, Flux is able to synchronize also the delete operations. So if that file goes away, then it will call Kubernetes API and will delete that resource from your cluster. Recently, Flux got customized support. How, how this works is you can configure Flux to run generators and customized patches with a file called .flux.yaml. That, that file, of course, is stored in, in your Git repo. And inside that file, you can call the customized binary. So Flux comes with the customized binary and the Helm binary and other um, OSAX tools. And based on this file, uh, Flux will run the generators. In this example, Flux will run customized build um, on the root of your um, Git repo. Uh, it captures the standard out of customize and it applies all those definitions in your cluster. Um, with the patch file, Flux will uh, scan your deployments, uh, see if any of those uh, need a container image update. If it does, it will modify the patch file, will commit the patch file to Git, and afterwards run customized build, and this is how it drives automatically uh, image updates. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about multi-tenancy. So I'm, uh, I'm going to assume that um, you have a Kubernetes cluster, let's say for um, development purposes, and that cluster is shared by multiple dev teams. And you also have a cluster administrator team. So, there are the dev teams and the cluster administrators. This is, this is how uh, we define our tenants. So there are two types of operations that your teams can, uh, can do inside the cluster. So the, all the cluster-wide operations are performed by the cluster administrators and all the namespace scoped operations are performed by team members. With Kubernetes RBAC, we can enforce restrictions. For example, um, uh, we can um, prohibit a team member from modifying uh, cluster-wide objects. And we can also uh, prevent a team member for, from changing something uh, in another team namespace or another team objects. How we apply GitOps to multi-tenancy, we will have one Git repo for the cluster administrators. And inside that Git repo, the administrators can define uh, cluster-wide objects like custom resource definition, admission controllers, validation controllers, network policies, and so on. And they will also provision um, the teams. What that means, it, 
they, uh, the administrators will create namespaces, service accounts, and Flux instances for each team uh, that is supposed to share the same cluster. For the dev teams, we have, so each dev team will have its own Git repository and its own namespace. And inside that Git repository, uh, a team can define its applications with um, Kubernetes deployment specs, uh, Helm releases, Flagger, Canary, custom resources, and so on. What's important here is the fact that inside the dev team uh, repository, only uh, objects, only namespaced objects are allowed. If let's say uh, someone puts their, um, let's say a custom resource definition, um, that file will not be applied on the cluster. So each, day, each, each team has its own namespace, has its own Git repo, and has its own Flux instance that's running inside that namespace. And this is how it looks. What this means is, let's say, a dev team wants to have an ingress controller, right? Um, the workflow will be the team names, the team one requests that to the cluster admins, and the cluster admin can. Um, deploy that ingress controller using the cluster git repo. And afterwards, uh, the team one members can create ingress objects inside their namespace, inside their namespace. But the team member cannot deploy an ingress controller, for example, because an ingress controller, why? Because an ingress controller usually has a cluster role binding and that will not be possible to do from a, from a team git repo. How we can enforce tenant isolation with, um, with a setup like this? We can, of course, create node pools and use affinity and taints to isolate a team uh, workloads on dedicated hardware. Um, I think node pool is a GK concept, but you can create this kind of node groups and you add a label to them, let's say the name of the team, and afterwards you can enforce with affinity, anti-affinity, and things. Um, all the workloads defined on in a team Git repo will be deployed only on, on those nodes that have those labels or things. Um, another way to do the isolation is to enforce uh, resource quotas. So you can limit the compute resource uh, per team. Uh, you can also use network policies to restrict cross namespace traffic. So for example, you can, you can restrict access for, for, let's say, team one cannot call the database of team two and so on. Uh, you can also use pod security policies. Um, for example, EKS comes with uh, PSP enabled by default. And I think you can enable it on any Kubernetes cluster that's 113 or something like that. So with pod security policies, you can prevent uh, running privileged containers, can uh, prevent running containers that wants to access the host network or the host uh, file system and so on. Um, it's a great way to restrict access to, uh, to the hosts. And finally, you can use the open policy agent admission controller to enforce custom policies. And we'll see how, how that works uh, with Flux. So in the open policy agent um, 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 Git organization, there is a project called Gatekeeper which allows you to define um, custom validation for all kinds of resources, right? So when, when let's say you want, if you want to enforce a custom policy, for example, um, let's say you, you want to prevent a team for, from reusing, um, 
you know, public domains in use by another team, right? So when, you, when a team creates an ingress definition, you want to check that um, that um, domain value is not already in use. You can, um, you can automate that with Gatekeeper and Gatekeeper will, uh, will run a validation using, the, um, using a custom resource and a custom resource definition. And I will show you in, the, in, in, in an example um, how this works. The idea is that when Flux applies the, the definition that's inside it, Kubernetes will, will send those objects to Gatekeeper. Gatekeeper will run all the validation on them. And if, um, if it rejects them, then Flux will, um, will notify you that something has been rejected from, from your Git repository and so on. So it's a great way to, to harden the multi-tenancy story. Okay. Going to show you any questions so far before I go to to the demo repository. I haven't seen anything posted. Looks good. Okay. Okay. So uh, one second. Okay. So inside the Flux CD organization, this is the new home of uh, Flux uh, as a CNCF sandbox project. So we moved Flux from WeWorks to, to the Flux CD org. Um, there is a project called multi-tenancy and this can serve as uh, a starting point when you want to build a multi-tenant cluster. Um, so we have a couple of things in here. Um, we use customize to um, be able to create Flux instances per namespace and the Flux instance that's running as cluster admin. And how we do that, we have a, a base directory here, which contains the Flux and memcache definition. Now, we have um, an installer here, this installer is just um, um, a customized uh, setup that uh, deploys Flux as the cluster admin. And if we look at the Flux patch file, this is how we can override the base Flux definition with, uh, uh, with the global settings that, that we want. For example, here, um, we tell Flux to connect to um, the memcache, memcache server. And what's important here, we tell Flux where our Git repository is. So because this is the cluster admin, um, uh, Flux instance will tell it to connect to the dev cluster repository. And this, this is basically that repository, right? So when you deploy Flux, Flux will connect to this repository and it will synchronize the, the cluster uh, directory from here. And inside this cluster directory, we can define our uh, teams. Uh, we define here first team and inside here, we have another uh, Flux patch. And what this does, it configures the Flux instance for, uh, for this particular team. How it does that, it configures Flux to connect to the team one uh, Git repository. And another important thing here, it tells Flux to only look at the team one namespace. So Flux, for example, scans uh, container um, um, images, right? Um, this Flux instance will only look at the containers running in the team one namespace and will only apply definitions that are, um, that target this namespace. It will, it will ignore any other uh, definition that targets another namespace and so on. And this is also enforced with uh, RBAC. So if we look at the RBAC setting here, there are only two cluster roles for each uh, Flux instance, and they are read-only cluster roles. For example, uh, 
for Flux to function, it needs to read your, uh, the custom resource definition that are inside your cluster and custom resource definition are a um, global object. So this is the only cluster role that Flux needs. And I've also created um, another um, cluster role binding for, uh, the, um, for the security policy profile. Other than that, inside the, um, the base directory here, if we look at what Flux can do inside the namespace, it has a role and a role binding. So you can do everything, any, anything, you can do anything inside that namespace and only that. This is how we can um, enforce Flux to restrict its access to a single namespace. Now, also here in the, in the cluster directory, this is how you can create uh, your teams, but you can also create common objects. For example, you can put here your custom resource definition. And for example, here I'm, I'm having the, the Helm release custom resource. Um, usually team members that need uh, that need uh, a special custom resource, they could make a pull request on the on this uh, repository for the administrators to review it and allow that custom resource to be uh, deployed on the on the cluster. Also here um, we have the gatekeeper definition, so it contains the the deployment uh, of of gatekeeper and also um, it contains templates and constraints. So how Gatekeeper works, um, you can create a constraint template with, uh, with the validation code. And one second. Okay, and the templates here. Yes, and the container resources now. One second. Yeah, here in the template there are. So, with, uh, with Gatekeeper, you basically create these templates where you can define with the, with the Rego language how you want to validate uh, objects that are being submitted by Flux inside the cluster, inside the team namespace. And you can for example, here I'm denying uh, any kind of um, deployment that doesn't specify uh, uh, resources in terms of memory and CPU, resources requests and resources and the limits. So this is an example how we can prevent uh, workloads without limits or requests from being applied on the cluster. Um, Another, another thing, another example that's, uh, that's inside this, uh, this repository on is, um, is flagger. So here uh, you have the flagger definition. And what this does, it uses the, the flagger uh, base definitions, which are in, uh, in its own repository and it applies a patch for it that tells flagger to to, um, to use the Kubernetes provider and connect to its own Prometheus server. So this is the, this is the way you can build up your, uh, your cluster in here and create namespaces and for each namespace have this uh, separation of, of concerns between teams. And this was it. I'm very interested in your questions. Anybody have any questions? So are these some follow-up? Um, what are some good follow-up areas where people can learn? Oh, in fact, uh, here I'll paste one of the questions here. How can I see the oh, chat? How might one review deployments of Flagger? Review. Yeah. Could 
<laughs> no demo. No, the demo was showing the the actual uh, uh, the actual repository. I mean, a demo will be to run uh, run install, and that's it. Um, and the class will be created with all the, all those namespaces. So it's not much of a demo. You have to play with this stuff on your own. Um, um. Yeah, so the earlier question about um, reviewing deployments of Flagger, could you be, could you share a little bit more about what you're looking for? How am I might review? So, okay. Okay, so a, a team, a team, um, repository will look like this. So this is the cluster admin repository, what I've, what I've shown here. And this is an example for a team repository. So a team repository will have a customized YAML in the in a base file where, and it includes all kinds of workloads that the team uh, wants to deploy inside the namespace. And here inside the workloads, you can have all your application definition and for application definition, you can also add the canary uh, spec to that definition. Uh, and you can, with that canary spec, you can tell Flagger how to run the, the canary analysis and so on. So if, if someone wants to review that, uh, usually a team member will make a pull request inside this, uh, on this repository, on its own team repository. The team members will review the change you'll merge the change into the repository, then Flux will synchronize that new definition with the cluster and Flagger will run a canary analysis for you. And based on the canary analysis result, Flagger will post the uh, analysis result with if the canary failed or not, why it failed and so on. Uh, it will post that information to Slack or Microsoft Teams and you can decide from there if you want to roll it back or roll over a new version and so on. So the, the review part is more about, uh, is driven through pull requests, if this is what you're asking. He said, one, how can I enforce order, the order of the installation with Flux? For example, I would like to install Istio before anything else. So yeah, what's the order of installations? You cannot do that with Flux. Um, Flux has no way of um, enforcing order. It, Flux will apply things in a particular order, but it will apply them all at once. So for example, Flux will will apply namespaces before deployments or yeah, things like that. Um, if you want to install things like Istio and other um, uh, components that need, let's say, um, injection webhooks and all, all this stuff. Uh, with this multi-tenant setup, you'll, you'll, you'll have to put your Istio definitions in here in the cluster. So if you put your ECO definition here, that definition will get applied before you connect, uh, let's say, a team flux to the, uh, uh, to the cluster. So the ECO definition will get applied and will get installed before you connect the, the team flux instances to each team Git repository. So in a way, it's a manual, it's a manual order. Uh, if you do, if you do it in in this case, um, yeah, this is the answer. Not much of an answer, but this is how we can do it. Um, other questions? So given that all environments should be reflected in the Git repo, how and what tools should I use for populating Kubernetes secrets for the apps? And how and where should I store the secrets? Is Vault a good option for that? 
So uh, WeWorks internally uses um, a controller called Shield Secrets. Uh, it's made by Bitnami, and it's an open source controller. Uh, what Shield Secrets allows you to do is it comes with a, with a controller and a CLI. The controller creates a, a private and public key inside the cluster. You can share the public key with all your peers. So everybody can encrypt a secret and place that secret in a, um, uh, one second, I'll give you the link. Okay, here is the link. So the idea is with this CLI, you can encrypt the, the secrets with the public key. You, you put that file in Git. No one can decrypt it uh, except the sealed secret controller that runs inside your cluster. Uh, another option with Flux uh, is through PGP. So you can encrypt with Git encrypt, I think it's called the solution. Uh, and you give Flux a, a, the PGP key and Flux will be able to decrypt uh, your Git repo before it applies it on the cluster. So you can keep certain files or the whole Git repo encrypted and Flux will be able to decrypt it. So these are the two options. Of course, you can also use a uh, vault if there is a, I don't know, a CRD controller that deals with uh, vault secrets. And I think there is. The idea is that Flux is not opinated about what it synchronizes. So if it's a custom resource that does something, you can put that custom resource in Git and, and Flux will do its job. We'll run the customization on top of that and that's it. And we'll apply it on the cluster. So you can definitely use vault if you want. So the question is, can you describe how to promote same apps from one cluster to another cluster? Like the prod only using branches. So how can you promote uh, applications between clusters? Um, of course, you can have a Git repository and have a branch for each cluster, run one Flux per cluster. And when you, when you set up Flux, you can uh, tell it at which uh, branch it should look. So you can have a dev branch, a staging branch, a production branch, and so on. And you can uh, merge from one branch to another. This is one option. Um, another option will be to have all your definitions in the same branch, but different directories. And uh, you can use uh, uh, SAMVR filters to tell, for example, the, uh, the Flux running in production to look for new patch releases and automatically apply them and so on. Uh, we at Weavers, we use uh, one directory per cluster and the same branch. And each Flux instance synchronizes from a different directory and we promote uh, an app from one directory to another. Cool. Round good. Well, I'll start sharing my slides. If you have any last questions, feel free to type them in. Oh, here's another. <laughs> so good. And what is the benefit of using customized with Flux over Helm with Flux? Okay. So Helm is intended to be used at namespace level. Um, you cannot have a Helm chart. Well, you can now with Helm 2, but I think with Helm 3 will go away. Uh, you cannot have a Helm chart that provisions namespaces, for example. If you do that, it's, it's the wrong approach, right? So I would say I would use customize to bootstrap my cluster and create things like custom resource definition, namespaces, uh, 
and all these cluster add-ons. And for uh, deploying apps, let's say I want to deploy a Redis cluster or a MongoDB cluster and so on, I would use uh, Helm charts for that because there are official Helm charts uh, that work well and so on. So you don't have to build all these YAMLs from scratch on your own. Um, but for cluster add-ons, uh, cross chain space operations, I would definitely use customize. For um, out of the box solutions on deploying, I don't know, databases, ingress controllers, and all this stuff, I will I will use Helm. So in a way, I I don't see those two as competitors, but more of a way to um, to use them both, one for cluster bootstrapping and um, namespace management and one for deploying uh, apps. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, thanks for your very engaged questions. Can you guys see my slides? Yeah. Yes, excellent. So uh, as I mentioned, if you haven't joined us before, this is called the Weave Online User Group. Uh, we've had different seasons. This season we run on Tuesdays at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Sometimes we have special events on different days of the week, but it's usually every Tuesday you can catch us here. Here are some of the topics that are coming up. Um, with Footloose is actually one of the open source projects that one of our engineers has created. So if you're interested in that, we've got that. Uh, if you're an Amazon user looking at EKS, uh, we are the creators of EKS Cuddle. So we'll be presenting on that with them. So got plenty more. And in fact, if you haven't joined us before, the link at the bottom here is our meetup page. That's the single source of truth that has the calendar. That's the best place to uh, subscribe and find out what we have coming up. Uh, if you are interested more about GitOps, uh, we've got this bit.ly here for our GitOps guide. It's an ebook. I'll definitely follow up and send you that if you'd like to read more about it. And if you have any questions for us, feel free to email me um, or reach out to us on our Slack channel. So we'll be following up in the email. So check that out. We'll have these links for you. So with that, do we have any last ones? Excellent. Well, perfect timing. We're at the 45th minute. And thanks all for your uh, engaged questions. Thank you, Stefan, for joining us and giving us this talk. We really appreciate it. And so we're thanks, going to and yeah. yeah. Try out the multi-tenancy stuff. Play with it. Uh, open issues on if you find any way of improving it or yeah any suggestions are welcome yeah excellent yeah thank you so much for uh, in advance for any uh, feedback that you have so thanks a lot see you guys next time bye